back. You're going the wrong way. You're making a huge mistake. Just imagine you're driving on a road with a bridge out, yet nothing or no one warns you to slow down or turn around or stop. As hard as it is to hear, being warned is sometimes the most loving thing someone can do for us. Welcome to Through the Bible with our teacher, Dr. J. Vernon McGee. In our five-year journey through the Bible, we're traveling down a stretch of road today in Ezekiel 33 that has a big warning sign posted. I mean big. The man of the hour is the prophet Ezekiel, who firmly and lovingly calls people back to him. Some will listen, most will not. I guess not much has changed in the centuries between us. Let's pray for our hearts to be ready to hear and obey the Lord. Heavenly Father, thank you for breathing out your word, for teaching us what to believe, encouraging us, correcting us, and then teaching us how to live righteously before you and before men. Help us to listen now with willing hearts, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Here's Through the Bible with Dr. J. Vernon McGee. Now, friends, I hope you found your place here in the 33rd chapter of this very wonderful book of Ezekiel. Now, we have come actually to the last major division of the book. From here, chapter 33 through 48, the last chapter, we will see now the glory of the Lord and the coming kingdom. And there is a tremendous break here, and we'll call attention to it as we move along into this particular passage here. Now, the previous chapter, that is chapter 32, concluded the predictions concerning the nations that were round about, that were actually contiguous to the land of Israel. And they were very closely related to them, of course, actually related by blood. In this section we are coming to, this man Ezekiel returns back to Jerusalem. And Jerusalem and Israel will be a subject, but not like it was before. You see, up to chapter 25, everything pointed to the destruction of Jerusalem. And he prophesied that. It came to pass, and the false prophets were proved wrong. Now, he immediately went off the air, let's say. He was silent, dumb, as we're told here, couldn't speak. That is, he was speaking, but no longer about Jerusalem. Then he gave these prophecies from chapter 25 through 32 about the surrounding nations. There was quite a few of them that were adjoining Israel, and there was Tyre, and Sidon, and then Egypt. And now he's speaking again. He's back on the air. But he's talking about Jerusalem no longer going to be judged because it was judged by that time. He looks now into the future of the coming kingdom, and everything from here on points to that. As it were, he sets his automatic pilot on, and he gets his directions, his bearing, and he just zeroes in on the coming kingdom and when the glory of the Lord will be displayed again on the earth. Now, that makes this a very interesting section. Now, first of all, in chapter 33 here, we have the commission renewed to this man, and not only renewed, but it will be also, he'll be commended for the fact that he's done a good job up to this point, and from now on, he's going to be speaking to the people of Israel how they're to live in captivity. And how were they to live? In expectancy of the future. Before, they had no hope because of their sin. But now he looks down into the future, and they have a hope now. And today, we have a hope. But our hope is not anchored in anything that men do down here or any gyrations of psychoanalysis. Our hope today is not a philosophy, but it rests upon the Word of God and what He has said will take place in the future. And that is the lodestar of the child of God, not the same as Israel, moving into the millennium. 
we're moving into actually the new Jerusalem, and that is the thing that's immediately head of the church. Now let's come here to this particular chapter, and we'll lift out some things through this section here. Chapter 33 opens on the same note. This is a stuck record as far as Ezekiel is concerned. Verse 1, again the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, he doesn't want you to forget that he's not giving you his theory or ideas, but this is the word of the Lord. Now he says, Son of man, speak to the children of thy people and say unto them, When I bring the sword upon a land, if the people of the land take a man of their borders and set him for their watchman, if then he seeth the sword come upon the land, he blow the trumpet and warn the people. Now again, he reverts back to the commission that he gave to this man, Ezekiel, at the very beginning. And he likens it to the watchman in that day. Here is a city. It's a wall city. Most of the cities of importance in that day, if they were subject to an invader, built a wall around. At night, they were appointed, which means the king or the ruler or those that were in authority, appointed a man as the watchman. And he was upon the wall and watched during the night. And I think during the night he called off the watches. All's well. And he looked out on the desert and didn't see the moving of any enemy. And he could say all's well. But the interesting thing was the false prophets were saying all's well. And the enemy was coming. They were too blind to see. Now this man here, Ezekiel, had given them the warning. Verse 6. But if the watchmen see the sword come and blow not the trumpet and the people be not warned, if the sword come and take any person from among them, he's taken away in his iniquity, but his blood will I require at the watchman's hand. Now, the people are going to be judged, but the watchman will be held responsible if he doesn't warn them. Now, Ezekiel had to warn them. The false prophet said not. He'd done a good job. Now again, verse 7, So thou, O son of man, I have set thee a watchman unto the house of Israel. Therefore thou shalt hear the word of my mouth and warn them from me. Now he had fulfilled that commission, you see. Now he says here, When I say unto the wicked, O wicked man, thou shalt surely die. If thou dost not speak to warn the wicked from his way, that wicked man shall die in his iniquity. You see, the responsibility of the watchman, and that's what we're talking about here, is to warn the wicked because they're going to be judged. But he is to give them a warning. Now, they didn't hear him. They didn't listen to him. But that's the only way that the watchman can actually clear himself. Now, that today means that the man who's teaching the Word of God is not required to get results. A great many people, they always say, let's get an evangelist that can get results. And if people see folk moving in a meeting, they think that if they're in the back and they come forward, that's good. And if they're forward and go to the back, that's still good, just so you get people moving. May I say to you that it's not the important thing. The important thing when a man is finished giving a message is actually not the result is has he given the word of God? Has he given them warning? And that is the important thing. Actually, the thing I look at is not the folk who come forward. It's the people that walk out after the benediction. Have they been warned? That's the important thing. We've been looking at the wrong crowd. And we say, oh, so-and-so gave such a sweet gospel invitation. And a lot of sweet people came forward. No decisions were actually made, but you know we had a movement going on and going forward and going backwards, going every direction. I remember when I changed in downtown Los Angeles, having people come forward, many timid people before a large congregation, and so we asked them to go to the back. We had a prayer room and asked them to go there, and I had a few old-timers that really got excited, and I said, what is your problem? And one said they should come forward. I said, do I understand you correctly? That they should go east and not go west? 
Well, they said, we don't mean it that way. Well, I said, that's exactly what you're saying. You see, friends, the important thing for the man who's given out the word of God's warning. Now, wait just a minute. Oh, I thank God when there are results. And we have literally hundreds of letters here now of people who've accepted Christ as Savior just through listening to the Word of God. I rejoice in that. But frankly, my business is to give out the Word of God. And I frankly want to make sure that the fellow that hears it and doesn't do anything, he's been properly warned. If he's not, I'm responsible. So that's the reason that maybe I give it out as I do, as this man has noticed and many others have commented on it. Now, let's move down to verse 11. Say unto them, as I live, saith the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn ye, turn from your evil ways, for why will ye die, O house of Israel? Now, the thing that's quite obvious, God doesn't want to judge. Judgment is a strange work. You remember Isaiah said, and now he wants to save them and he's urging them to turn to him and accept life. Now these people, they had another complaint. They said, God is not just in his judgment. And I'm going to drop down now to verse 17. Yet the children of thy people say, the way of the Lord is not equal. That is, he's not fair. He judges their body alike. And we got some good people among us, you see. But as for them, their way is not equal. Now, when the righteous turneth from his righteousness and committeth iniquity, he shall even die for it. Now, we're not talking here about somebody losing salvation. God says when one of his children gets into sin, he'll judge him. Now, that's exactly what Paul said. If we would judge ourselves, we'd not be judged. And he says through John, he said, there is a sin unto death. Now, sin for who? For a lost man? No, he's already under the sentence. That's a child of God. But what kind of death? Physical death. God judges Christians today. And I'm amazed that some folk don't catch on after a while when they're in a work and the work is going down and getting in debt and everything. You'd think the message had come through that maybe God's moving in judgment. Maybe things are not right there, you see. Now, God says that he's righteous in what he does. When the righteous turneth from his righteousness, committeth iniquity, he shall even die for it. But if the wicked turn from his wickedness and do that which is lawful and right, he shall live by it. Now, if a wicked man would turn to God, God will save him. God's made that very clear. Yet ye say, verse 20 now, the way of the Lord's not equal. O ye house of Israel, I will judge you every one after his ways. Now, the fact of the matter is, this man's been carried into captivity, and he was a godly man. He had trusted God, and he's carried just like the most wicked person, and he's complaining. I don't blame him for complaining because it looks like God's being unfair. God says, don't misunderstand. You are being carried into captivity because the nation has sinned. And you're identified with the nation. And you and I today have to pay an excessive insurance premium because there are a lot of alcoholics around today. I don't drink, but I have to pay for them too. And I have to pay taxes because we've got a lot of foolish folk in Washington that just believe in spending money. And we have to pay for that. Actually, we're identified with a nation. And that was true of Israel. But God says, wait a minute, I'm going to judge every one of you. And my friend, I don't care who you are, you're going to stand before God. Now, if you're a child of God today, he'll judge you for your sin. You won't lose your salvation, but he'll take you to the woodshed. Now, if you're a lost man, you've got no claim on God at all. Now, he's made that very clear in the New Testament, in 1 Peter, the third chapter, verse 12, for the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous, and his ears are open unto their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against them that do evil. God says, he doesn't say he won't hear the prayer of the wicked. He just says he hears the prayers of the righteous, and he's not obligated to hear the other. But if that wicked man would cry out to him, God would deliver him. But 
the wicked man has no claim on God. When you hear people today say, why does God let this happen? And they're unsaved. Well, my friend, you have no claim on God. God's righteous when he's judging a lost world. And we forget that, that this happens to be his world. Now, will you notice this? And he's going to be very clear. Oh, this section here, I tell you, it gets right down to the nitty gritty. Now, let me read verse 21. It came to pass in the 12th year of our captivity, in the 10th month, in the fifth day of the month, that one that had escaped out of Jerusalem came unto me, saying, The city is smitten. Now, Ezekiel had already prophesied it, but he had no information. God told him the city was destroyed. And at that time, his wife died on the very day. And he says, don't you grieve, because I want these people to know that I've repudiated that city. They think that I have to have Jerusalem. They think that I will not destroy it. They don't believe I'll judge sin. And he said, I am. Therefore, don't weep for her and let them know that at this time the city is being destroyed for its sin. The city is smitten. Now, I want to tell you when this was brought to these people, it was absolutely something that dumbfounded them. They were absolutely overwhelmed by it. They had never heard anything like it. They never believed that anything like this could possibly take place. But it's happened now. Now the hand of the Lord was upon me in the evening. This is verse 22. Before he who was escaped came and had opened my mouth until he came to me in the morning and my mouth was open and I was no more dumb. Now you see at the end of chapter 24, that time Ezekiel announced the destruction of Jerusalem, the bloody city. It's gone down now. From then on, he had no word about Jerusalem. From chapter 25, here through chapter 32, been no word about Jerusalem. It's all about these surrounding nations. Now, God no longer makes the man dumb about Jerusalem. He says, I have some messages for you about Jerusalem. Now we can begin to look to the future. These people were hanging on to the false prophets, and they had no word at all. Now he says, then the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, this is verse 24 now, Son of man, they that inhabit those wastes of the land of Israel speak, saying, Abraham was one, and he inherited the land, but we are many. The land is given us for an inheritance. They go back. They say, well, look, God took care of Abraham, and there's just one of him, and there are a whole lot of us. Yes, but there's a lot of difference. Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him for righteousness. These people not believing God. That's the reason they've gone down. Verse 25, Wherefore say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, Ye eat with the blood, and lift up your eyes toward your idols, and shed blood, and shall ye possess the land? God says, I won't let you have the land. That's the reason I put the heathen and the pagan out of this land, is because of their sin, and you are doing the same things. Now, verse 28, For I will lay the land most desolate, and the pomp of her strength shall cease, and the mountains of Israel shall be desolate, that none shall pass through. Now, I can't get elated, as some of uh, my very good minister friends do. When they get to that land, they get into ecstasy. You'd think they were on drugs, the way some of them act. Oh, isn't it wonderful to see this land? Friends, it's just about as desolate as any place that you could possibly find today. That land is desolate because the judgment of God is upon it. All you've got to do over there is look, and today there's a big water shortage, and you put a little water on that land, and my, it blossoms like the rose. But there's not enough water. That's the great problem. Now, therefore, I would say we're not seeing prophecy fulfilled till they get a little more water over there. I suggest to these fellows that are going to find so much fulfilled prophecy when they go over there, I'll take a gallon of water with them and help out because God says it'll be desolate and his judgment is not upon only a people but upon a land. Now he goes on to say, verse 30, 
Also, thou son of man, the children of thy people still are talking against thee by the walls and in the door of the houses, and speak one to another, every one to his brother, saying, Come, I pray you, and hear what is the word that cometh forth from the Lord. You see, they are shaken. They're going to listen to him now, but they won't follow through. And they come unto thee as the people come, and they sit before thee as my people, and they hear thy words, but they will not do them. For with their mouth they show much love, but their heart goeth after their covetousness. You see, they like to come to church and hear all about love and nice, sweet, lovely things, but it has not changed their lives at all. Remember James very practically says, he says, get down where the rubber meets the road. Be ye doers of the word, and not hearers only. And that's what these people were. Verse 33, and when this cometh to pass, lo, it will come, then shall they know that a prophet had been among them. They now know that Ezekiel's a prophet. But now here's the interesting thing. They did not believe he was a prophet before. They now know he's a prophet of God, but they still don't listen to him. May I say to you that unbelief today is willful. It's not mental. That's not your problem, my friend. Your brain and my brain's not big enough for to create a hurdle that you can't get over the Word of God and the problems. Your, your problem is you don't want to give up your sin. That was these people. And they were willing to come and listen. It had no effect upon them whatsoever. This is tremendous, is it not? But we must leave off. So until next time, may God richly bless you, my beloved. The question that Dr. McGee leaves us with is worth repeating. When we hear God's Word, does it make a difference in our lives? Let's make it personal. When I hear God's Word, does it change me in any way? To examine this deeper, I suggest you check out the Inside Story. That's a small brochure that we have of Scripture passages selected by Dr. McGee to help you understand the gospel message of salvation. You can find it on our website, ttb.org, by clicking on the banner, How Can I Know God? And if you're willing to take Dr. McGee's challenge to heart, then I suggest reading the verses and asking God to help you be willing to apply what you read to your life. Also available on ttb.org are many other terrific Bible study materials, some available for free and others for purchase. So take your time and soak it all in. It's important for you to know that Through the Bible provides these resources to help you in your walk with the Lord, not to make a profit or to fund the broadcast. As we close the study today, we'll hear straight from Dr. McGee on how Through the Bible is funded. To find out more or to partner with us as we continue to take God's whole word to his whole world, please call us at 1-800-65-BIBLE or write to us at Box 7100, Pasadena, California, 91109, or in Canada, Box 25325, London, Ontario, N6C 6B1. Now here again is Dr. J. Vernon McGee. From time to time, it was my custom to state the policy of the Through the Bible radio program. And it's time again for it to be stated, and I would like to do that. It has never been our plan or purpose from the very beginning to use high-pressure methods. We do not send out junk mail. Everyone that's on our mailing list got there because they asked to be put there or else someone asked for them. We today believe that if you are not able to support the program and you want our notes and outlines that God will raise up somebody down the street or over in the next town to send in enough for you and for them also. We believe that the real test is the support that comes from any area, and we will not continue on a program if we do not get a reasonable amount of support. And we always give every station a fair opportunity to see if it's going to pay for itself. And that, by the way, is all that we ask. We do from time to time appeal to you to support our foreign broadcasts. After all, we cannot ask them 
uh, that is, the Chinese or the people of India or the people of South America or the people in Russia to support our program. We believe that there are enough folk in this country that are interested in getting out the word over iron curtains, under bamboo curtains, and through the curtains of indifference and sin today uh, to uh, get the word of God out to the world. So we just let you know this and trust you'll understand that we do need your support, though we will not violate our rule by using high-pressure methods. Jesus made it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. We're so grateful for the faithful and generous support of Through the Bible's partners who are being used by God to take the whole word to the whole world.